So thanks very much for your attendance. Um, I'll see at the start of the meeting. Um, my eyes are perfectly fine with my glasses on. I always find it difficult seeing this uh, the chat bar. So if I miss him out, I'm not doing it deliberately, and the, the clerk will let me know if I've missed anyone out. So I'll see that at the outset. Um, do we have any apologies? I know. Yes. Yeah, Mark. Michael A from uh, Kevin Doherty has got an appoint another appointment. Okay, Mark. Do we any further? There's also an, an apology from uh, Councillor Mooney. Um, and in terms of the standing orders, Councillor Curran um, is, is going to be the substitute member for Councillor Mooney at the meeting today. Okay, can I also add in, just when I remember, Willie Doolan uh, contacted me yesterday. He's got uh, some uh, issues that he can't make the meeting today. So any further apologies? Don't see him else there. So can I remind everyone to keep their... Uh, the uh, appliances on mute where possible. And can I also maybe remind you, I don't know if you've seen this in the paper, not to have any filters on. We don't want them to turn up as a cat or a dog or anything like that. So without any further ado, I'll move on to item one in the agenda, which is declaration of interest in terms of ethical standards in public life. Do we have any? Don't see MD. So we'll move on then with that in mind. We'll move on to item two. And this is analysis and actions taken uh, uh, relevant to rodent and uh, compliance. So Paul Bannister's here and he's going to speak to us on that. Paul. Thank you, convener. Colleagues, good afternoon. As you will note from the papers, um, this committee paper starts at page five of the paperwork that you've been submitted. And this followed a motion to full council on the 13th of August 2020 in respect of seeking protective services to record and analyse all reports of vermin sightings made to the council, report this data to relevant council committee at regular intervals, and to help to measure the scale and impact of the issue to help inform our approach moving forward. Now, you will note from column 2.2 .2 that I have recorded the numbers of rat complaints that we've had. The figures show in the third column that the figures were not available in 1415, and only one was recorded for council domestic property in 1516. That's because we did not have the splits and the introduction of um, service request payment charges for private residents until the 1st of April 2016. And that's when we put a further delineation in on our database to record uh, which service requests came from our council tenants and which came from uh, private residences. The performance to year to date is for this year likely to improve from the figure that I prepped on the 2nd of December because there is always a slight lag on the information filtering through that we can report on. But the good news is that our response rate in terms of our performance targets that we set remains on target throughout these years. Now, as you can see, there was a significant drop in requests for pest control service when the council introduced the charges. But obviously, there has been an increasing trend and the numbers of complaints have gone up since that time. We are currently expecting around about 1,800 to 1,850 calls in the current financial year up to the 31st of March. From an analysis, we have looked at what we believe to be the main root causes of problems, uh, but we have decided to look at further analysis of data and we've created two new fields in our recording database. And they are firstly rat sightings either in streets or on land. And that was brought in in September of 2020. And prior to that, in May 2020, we brought in a field to be able to record and log cases where private residents were either um, citing that they were re uh, refusing to pay or that they were unable to pay for pest control services. We have now um, had a deal of discussion with colleagues in the Council's GIS team, and we are now starting to create overlays and overlaps so that we can record and monitor on a monthly basis and per annum moving forward for hotspot uh, activity in respect of rat complaints, uh, numbers that are reported from council tenants, numbers reported from private tenants, 
and numbers where there are sightings on street or on land or where people are citing that they are unable or refusing to pay. That information is going to be very useful to us now that we have a second pest control officer employed. Uh, our second officer, David, commenced service with us on the 18th of January this year. And we can now look at bolstering service capacity and looking to see what we can do to further mitigate any ongoing rat problems. Uh, more likely, um, the most important element there will be in the proactive baiting of specific problem areas. Now, that's a very brief run through. Um, the information <coughs> is there for members to see. And I'm very happy to answer any questions on the data that's available. Thank you. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, but we ha have had a, uh, an amendment in from Willie Goldie, and taken by Lynn Anderson. It's not. It's, it's to add on a third um, recommendation and the recommendations, and it, oh, it's going up on the screen just now, colleagues. I have got no problem with including this. Um, so if everybody wants to have a wee look, and if anybody otherwise mind it, can you please let me know? But I've got no problem with including that. I think that was an intention of the the, the service anyway. So. I don't see MD in the chat bar. I don't. Uh, the papers here for noting colleagues, so we're happy to note contents they're in. Perhaps it might be worthwhile my uh, just stressing at this point, convener, if I may. Um, okay, yes, well. It would be my intention to provide regular update reports uh, on these matters and the analysis of the data to every future environmental and transportation committee as we run through the cycle. Thank you. Thank you. So, have we agreed to note the report then, colleagues? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Wally. Fine. Thanks, convener. I know that the, certainly the, the figures that we have just now are, are historical. Yeah, we won't be getting much in the future. Have we any evidence of during lockdown of any council premises or that with an increase in rats? We heard about the people vacating places and making it almost a playground for them. Have we found that within council premises as yet? Paul, Paul, are you happy to come in there? Absolutely, convener, and thank you, councillor. Um, I'm not seeing any credible data to suggest that, that there is a marked difference in the way that the, the right stats and the complaints uh, data is coming through. But that is something that we will continue to monitor as we are uh, currently um, continuing to go through the pandemic and under uh, various restrictions. The main issues that we need to keep on top of as a council in relation to tenancies within our properties are the ongoing proofing issues. But we are in regular engagement with colleagues in housing to make sure that if there are any proofing issues or if there are any issues in respect of uh, detritus or dumping within garden areas or common lands to ten uh, tenanted properties, that we do take the necessary action to ensure across the services that we take uh, relevant action to make sure that these problems are alleviated. But that is one of the things that we will look at moving forward. Okay. Uh, Tracy. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly come on and let's say thank you to the officers for the work they've done in providing this support here on the back of the motion in August. It's really informative. So thank you. Thanks, for thank Tracy. You, um, I don't see any uh, else in the chat bar, so we're happy to note the contents of the report. Okay, thanks for that. Moving on to item three on the agenda, college, which is the community asset transfer request of View Park Gardens, and it's from pages 11 to pages 30. And Liz Ann McMurray is here to speak us through this report. Liz Ann. Thank you, convener. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Because sometimes I have problems with my audio. Loud and clear, Lizanne, loud and clear. Thank you. The purpose of this report is to provide the committee with the details of a community asset transfer request relating to an area of the Green Park Garden site, and that's outlined for you in Appendix 1. The application has been made by View Park Gardens Trust, and the report provides information on the outcome also of the investment process carried out in accordance with the Council's community asset transfer policy and process together with a recommendation on uh, the request from View Park Gardens Trust. 
Members are asked to know as a point of clarity that View Park Gardens Trust, um, described in terms of legislation as the community controlled body, has asked that it be confirmed to committee that the group should be referred to as a fully registered charity with Oscar, and they've provided the charity reference number. Their concern uh, in highlighting this to committee is that being not for prof a profit organisation without charitable statuses, it's often assumed that these are companies limited by guarantee not for profit. View Park Gardens Trust has been an official registered charity since 13th August 2020. When the initial application came in, they weren't, but they are now, and I would just want to, to reassure that information directly from the group. The report has been prepared in accordance with the Council's statutory obligations as set out uh, in Part 5 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act, Associated Guidance and the Council's Community Asset Transfer Policy, a copy of which you'll note is in Appendix E. In summary, as set out in Paragraph 1.2, upon the formal application being made, the relevant authority, i.e. the Council, is bound to carry out an assessment of the request establish that the applicant is a qualifying body and assess both the sustainability and likely benefit of the asset transfer. Benefits can include social wellbeing, economic benefit and provision of services and activities that would not otherwise be provided. Underpinning the CAT request is an aim to protect and preserve the View Park Gardens by restoring the site for use by individuals and community groups. The proposal seeks to provide scope for a hub to be developed from which a range of leisure opportunities for local could be provided as well as space for local groups to use. In line with the Council's Community Asset Transfer Policy, the findings of the Officer Assessment Panel was reported to the CAT Leadership Group, comprising the Head of Communities, Head of Asset and Procurement Solutions and the Executive Director of Enterprise and Communities for consideration. The assessment process identified and recognised that the group had undertaken significant work to prepare the application and engage with the local community under very challenging circumstances. However, several key factors led to the conclusion that the community benefits of transferring this asset on the terms proposed do not outweigh the risks and concerns identified through the assessment process. This is outlined in paragraph 2.5 and sections 1 and seven of the assessment report in Appendix 2 on pages 18 and 21 of your papers. Just briefly, in summary, these risks and concerns included the financial viability of the project, the limitations of the financial plan and projections in terms of these reflecting the operation of an asset of this. The group does not have a proven track record in managing and delivering services. Their experience of raising and generating a significant level of funds that would be required to deliver planned services from this site is limited, and the financial plans provided did not provide adequate reassurance on these matters. So it is on this basis that the recommendations are as set out in the report. Thank you, convener. Thanks for that, Lizanne. Um, do we have any comments or questions, colleagues? Surprisingly not. Oh, Wally, Wally, Wally Goldie. Thanks, Wally I, I know that we had a, an amendment which has been declared not competent because we don't have the agreement of the the group uh, essentially to extend the statutory pro process. But the group have wished to articulate that they feel that there has been a degree of inaccuracies within the report. Um, and would actually like to still be part of the community asset transfer process, but have greater communication than that with the council. Um, our, um, recommend, our, our amendment was to extend the process, as we don't have the, the permission of the group to do so, we, we won't be able to put that forward, but they do have lots of concerns about the report itself. Cheers. Thanks for that, Willie. I think you'll, you you know more than most that uh, we've tried and tried and tried to get some sort of form of words from the group to to see exactly that, and I I just can't see why it hasn't came forward. Uh, even to twenty two this afternoon, you know that we were working towards that, and unfortunately, it's not been forthcoming. There's nothing would ha uh, delight me more than this process to be uh, you know to engage with the group. Unfortunately. And I hate to say, use this analogy, you can lead a horse to water. Um, and 
it's, it's not been possible at this point in time. I'll bring the leader of the council in, Jim Logue. Yeah, I think all members know that the council is very supportive of community, community asset transfers. In fact, there's been a number of transfers which have been sourced over the last year since we formulated the policy in 2019. And I think we all recognise the enthusiasm and the commitment of officers who work in that section to deliver the aspirations of local communities. It's certainly disappointing that that has not been realised here. I think if the, order, the trust has any concerns, I'm sure that there will be scope for those to be articulated at the next stage, and that will be the appeal to the Scottish Government, which they rightly have pointed out they will access. So I think it's best that we agree to the recommendations today, and if an appeal goes to the Scottish Government, then I'm sure that the Council will defend their position robustly. Thanks for that. Any further comments or questions, colleagues? Wally? Thanks, convener. Can I move the direct make negative the report that we don't accept it? Well, um, do we have? I'm, I'm not sure on that one. Do we? Well, first of all, do you have a second for that? Sorry, Anne, are you second that? I have my, myself on mute there. Right, okay. Well, I, I, sorry, Mark. Do you want... Yeah, I've seen Councillor Anderson's hand up there, uh, convener, so um, we'll take Councillor Anderson down a second that. Can I, can I just clarify with yourself, Councillor Goldie, that the direct negative of, of the recommendations, um, the, 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 the outcome of that would be that the, the decision um, Time frame that's been agreed with the group would would be would be extended, and that would be that would be asking the council to take a decision to extend the time frame without the agreement of the group. Now, my understanding is that, that any agreement with um, any agreement to extend the, the timeline must be agreed by the group. Um, and my understanding is the application came in in June, and the council because it was during the uh, the, the, the lockdown that the council had an agreement in place that the the determination of the application would be in February 2021 for the council to take a, or to take a negative decision and not take a decision on that um, w without the agreement of the group would not be competent. All right, Robert. Robert wants to come in. Robert, can you maybe come in? Thanks. Just just for a point of clarification for for Councillor Goldie. To, to me, reading the recommendations, taking the negative is that we approve the application. That's the negative of it. Um, so if, if that is what is proposed, I, I would suggest that, that we actually get a form of words for the amendment to say that the, the application is approved. If the, the request is to extend the time scale, then uh, um, I, I think that would mean that we would not meet our statutory responsibilities. And, and, um, Subject to, to, to Mark's uh, advice, I would say that, that that was also not competent as the, the proposed amendment was. So if you're going for the, the, the negative, and, and my reading of it, Councillor Goldie, that means uh, for recommendation number two, it's rather than approving the rejection. What you're doing is, is, is not approving the rejection, which in effect is approving the, the cap transfer. It's just looking for clarification so that um, myself and Mark can, can make sure that we get the right decision. Thank you. Yes, that would be to approve the cat transfer then, please. Okay, and so you're moving that. Uh, is that old old Masio? You coming in? Thanks, convener. It, it was just a comment. The the uh, and my communication with with members of the the group. Uh, Understanding is that they're refuting the the fact that they've re rejected uh, the contact. Uh, just to make that clear. Well, I, I mean, at this stage in the process, I, I don't know um, how you can say that because there's been plenty of opportunity. So we have a position, colleagues. Sorry, Tracy Carragher, do you want to come in? Oh, sorry. Thanks, right. Michael. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, it was said earlier that um, it was known that the group were willing to, to appeal to Scottish Government. So there's the. I just don't understand. 
I may be missing something here, but what I'm hearing here is the group have not um, been in contact, but the council know the group will appeal. So that sounds to me as if they have had discussions with the group. Can that just be, be cleared up? Lizanne, do you want to come back in that? Or, sorry, Paul, eh, Robert, Robert, sorry, Robert. Yeah, I'd just like to, to come back. We've obviously been in discussion with the group for, for quite some period of time, um, as, as close to committee as two weeks ago, before the paper was published, and we approached them, told them we had concerns about the financial viability and the experience of the group, and asked them if, if they would wish to extend the time period so that they could um, go away and, and, and actually um, either build on their experience or, or look at getting a financial solution, which would mean that we would be looking at it, and they did not do so. So um, um, that leads us then, then to say, as Lizanne has pointed out, that the group have no experience of, of, of uh, operating a facility of this kind and do not have a business plan which would support it. Um, so, so we have been in touch. It may not have been the answers that the group were looking for, but but we did reach a point where the group wrote to us and said that they just wished the committee to make a decision, and they would then follow the process thereafter. So that's uh, why we're saying that, and that's down to the group whether they ask for a review. That's uh, purely in, in their view, depending on the outcome here. But but the outcome is, and, and the recommendation that, that we put forward was that we didn't think we could give over an asset of this value for a, a lease value of one pound per year based on the business plan that the group had presented. So so there has been communication, but the group have been very clear that they want us to make a decision on it. They 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 have had further opportunities to ask for an extension, and my understanding is that they have not wished to pursue that. Thanks, convener. Okay, thanks for that, Robert. Um, sorry, Jim Logue, I missed you out there. So I've got Jim Logue, then I've got uh, David Cullen, and I think Paul Dimaschio has come back in. So I'll take Jim Logue first. I'm rather surprised. I, I'm not sure whether Wally is going to pursue an amendment, as he previously outlined. I'd be extremely disappointed if he did so, because there's been a number of community asset transfers, and invariably they have gone for the market value. Now, you see here that the market value is £36,000 a year. The group have offered the derisory insulting sum of £1. They tell us it's a valued facility in that area, and yet they value it at one pound. I mean, that is quite bizarre. Michael, the convener, sent out an email to all members last week which showed the level and nature of engagement which has taken place between the group and our officers. And you can see that our officers have certainly gone well beyond the course of their own duty in trying to encourage and sustain contact with the group and direct them in an appropriate manner to generate funding and to try and get this transaction over the line. And notwithstanding that, there's been an incredible amount of negativity towards our officers, almost an inference about their personal and professional integrity. And I do not think that has been helpful at all. We would set out a very dangerous precedent. Sorry. Can I remain a dangerous precedent if we transfer this for one pound? What would we say to the card transfers that have already taken place? We'll now review your position and possibly rebate you. What do we do with future car applicants? Yes, based on the precedent of you part, we'll give you for one pound as well. Do you think that from an audit perspective that would be acceptable? I do not think so. I think we're putting ourselves into a very, very, very dangerous situation, making flesh of one foul of another. And I certainly would counsel your motion, Willie, or your amendment, and ask you to reflect on it. Thanks for that, Jim. Thank you. Um, David Collins. Thank you, Convener. Um, I would just like to reiterate and support the words of the Council Leader. North Lanarkshire Council, and I'm sure all elected members, irrespective of party political um, persuasion, support the, the principle of community asset transfer. But the principle of community asset transfer has got to be bound in, in sustainability, whether it be financial, whether it be the, the, the makeup of the group and the sustainability of the group, to ensure that assets that are transferred to community groups don't come back to the council. No, following a, fail, a failed asset transfer, if you like. So 
I would like to reiterate the words of the, the, the council leader that it is that North Lanarkshire do support the principle of community asset transfer. We are officers and officers have got the professional capability to assess asset transfer bids. We are officers um, submit a report to us primarily with a recommendation. The group have already indicated has been has been alluded to that they intend to appeal the 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 process to the Scottish Government, but I fail to see how we can support an amendment that looks to support the asset transfer, given the concerns of officers that are related and right through the report, not just the financial aspect, of it, there are concerns about the sustainability and the viability of the, the application right through the report. And I do agree with the council, uh, with the council, councillor Lord, the councillor leader, that there is an element of calling officer uh, integrity into question here because th they've produced a report that some are not actually agreeing with. Now, irrespective of whether we agree or disagree, officers are tasked to use their professional experience and expertise to write a report and provide us with the recommendations. They've done that in this case, and the recommendation as it currently stands, based on the, applica the application provided, is that the, the report is rejected. That's not to say the group couldn't come back in the future with, with an additional bid if they, they go back and reflect on the areas where the, the, the current application is failing. And I would just like to finally say that across the board, we all support community asset transfer, but it's got to be sustainable and it's got to be beneficial for both the, the group and North Lanarkshire Council so that North Lanarkshire Council are not left picking up the pieces. And we've got good examples of community asset transfers within our communities at the moment. Um, that's what I'd like to see convener. Thanks. Thanks for that, Councillor Colin. Uh, Paul Damasio, you might come back in. Uh, I've got Councillor Lennon. Thanks, convener. Um, no, I just I just wanted to address uh, some concerns that were additional concerns that have been pointed out to me by by the group as well. Um, Concerns they have, uh, and this this isn't to criticise officers. This is to raise potential issues. That by no means uh, we're here to criticise officers, but um, if there's any issues that, that that require addressing then or discuss, then that's that's what we're all here for. Um, I think they. I think it was June uh, last year. They they submitted their cat. But the final financial issues were only raised with the group two weeks ago, two weeks prior to this committee meeting. So just prior to the papers being being issued, therefore, uh, by a matter of days, um, you know, in terms of communication, if that if that's if that's the case, then the group really haven't had any time whatsoever to to react. Uh, and work with the council two weeks prior to this committee meeting in relation to the financial aspect. Again, if that's the case, then there's obviously a what's that seven eight month uh, gap <clears throat> that that communication in relation to the financial aspect. Right, Paul. Well, uh, as you see, me like the... clarification on that as to when the the financial aspect was raised with with the group. Well, before I bring officers in, it was made quite clear with the email I sent out last week with the, the correspondence from Lizanne that the, the correspondence with the group went back to, uh, to last June and a lot of it wasn't answered. Robert or Lizanne, do you want to come in and uh, clarify? I'll, I'll, I'll come in first, convener. Um, two weeks ago was when the paper was published showing the recommendations, Councillor Damasio. It's not when engagement and discussion took place with the group. Um, the discussion and engagement with the group has been ongoing since they submitted the application, and it's covered all aspects of the application. They were given a final opportunity two weeks ago to revise and reconsider, and they chose not to do so. So please don't think that that's when they were advised of any issues. The, the discussions have been ongoing. Um, as, as for uh, how we have approached it and, and what's been given, we, we need to remember the report is the culmination of, of the work of assessing the application um, is, is not the be all and end all, and, and the recommendations therein are the subject to the work that's been ongoing since the application was submitted. So, so a lot, whole load of discussions have been taking place um, 
throughout the process of the application and certainly not just in the last fortnight. Thanks, convener. Thanks. Lizanne, would you like to add anything further to that? No, other than to endorse what Robert said, it was uh, an opportunity for the group um, prior to the final consideration to, to add any, any more information in, into the process. Okay, thanks very much for that. Councillor Lennon, Greg. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. My question is in relation to process within this and the wider context. So, can can I ask an officer to explain to me how many successful cap processes processes we have across the authority at the moment? How many of them are supported by the community's teams in acquiring that cap? And in addition to that, is this an unusual set of circumstances that we find ourselves in, as opposed to a normal CAT process? Because having spoke to this group, it seems to me that there's quite a lot of CAT before the horse coming here. We'll know uh, allocate any significant time for the relevant funding to be acquired. The group cannot build appropriate capacity within the time frames of the CAT. So I'm curious to hear officers' opinions in relation to whether or not this is standard practice for community groups in North Lanarkshire, and what's the sort of vision moving forward that we're going to have an expectation for community groups to take over more cats and potentially the future due to budget restrictions. Robert, do you want to come in on that? I think probably based on Lausanne in terms of a number. So I don't know the numbers. Lausanne, but sorry. This is not, I'll just say this is not unusual. Not every community group who wants to pursue a CAT is successful and we have had very many successful and in fact some significant CAT transfers in the last year or, or 18 months but, but I'll let Lizanne may just give some detail on that. I don't have the, the, the numbers to hand but the, the figures are regularly reported through the Community Empowerment Committee and in fact there's a statutory report on the number of inquiries and the uh, number of successful cats, and that's an annual report that we, we produce and put through committee. Because it's also a requirement of the Community Empowerment Act, so happy to to, to recirculate that um, if required. Uh, there are a significant number of inquiries that don't get to the stage of a full formal um, assessment because groups work with the community's team to look at other avenues, including um, short-term leases of, of premises. Usually, um, groups approach the council from the perspective of wishing to operate a service from a building rather than it is um, an attempt to save um, a facility um, wh which the council is already taking a decision on. So this one is unusual from that, that perspective. Um, su successful recent uh, CAT applications, um, Coke Bridge Bowling Club, for example, that there was a well-developed business plan which was on the cusp of receiving funding at the point in time that that one was was considered. So it, the officer's view is that, that this is at a very, very early stage in development and we wouldn't usually see an application that was as early in its development going through the formal uh, decision-making process that, that lined for you. But it is a prerogative of the group to to insist that that happens, that the council makes the determination on it. Okay, thanks for that, Lizanne. Councilor supplementary, Chair. Supplementary. Can you go, can you go big? So, uh, just really quick then, obviously we've heard from Robert and Lizanne in relation to uh, not being able to pull the figures, so perhaps if I, I simplify that question then, could they perhaps inform me or indulge me in relation to the number of cats that have been successful over five years? Because I imagine that being a small number, surely that will be something that will be able to provide any cat that's been al allocated over five years. How many have we had in the authority? Lizanne? Convener, I would be giving in incorrect information if I speculated on that number. Um, I could make a guess at it, but I'm not going, I'm not prepared to do that um, to committee. I prefer to um, give the member that information or the committee that information offline. Okay, I think if, if you can do that offline then, uh, Lizanne, and give it to the committee. Yes, you are happy with that, of course. Thank you. Happy you. With that? Greg, you happy with that, yeah? Yes, Chair, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Goldie, why? Thank you, Convener. Just on reflection and the fact that there is an appeals process in which the group can put their, their points forward for that, uh, on reflection, I will withdraw the amendment. Thanks very much for that, Willie. Thank you. Um, so then, colleagues, I don't see any further names or uh, 
in the chat bar. I take it we haven't got any further questions or comments. Can I then uh, take you to the recommendations, which are on page 11, and can I ask you to agree the recommendations? Agree the recommendations. Thank you very much, colleagues. Moving on to item four, which is the biodiversity duty compliance, which is on page 31 to A56. Nicole Patterson is going to take us through this. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much, convener. First of all, members will be aware that the Nature Conservation Scotland Act 2004 places a statutory duty on all public bodies to further the conservation of biodiversity. This Act was amended in 2011 by the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act and it introduced a requirement for all public authorities to produce and make available a report every three years detailing their compliance with the biodiversity duty. So, In compliance with the Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011, the Annex report details the very significant work undertaken by North Lanarkshire Council under this duty between 2018 and 2021. That work is detailed across six key areas as laid out in section 2.2 of the report. And I'd ask members to note additionally that a new local biodiversity action plan as part of this report will be brought to committee during 2021, setting out the current and future priorities. Um, convener, I'd simply uh, ask members to look at the recommendations and I'm happy to take any questions on the report. Thanks for that, Nicole. Have we got any questions? And we've got one from is that Lynn Anderson, yeah. Lynn. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I welcome the draft plan and I note there are some references to the local plan, etc., in it without an explicit mention um, of the role of planning in biodiversity. I established some time ago that although there's a requirement for developers during the application process, um, to state on the application form what species that will be used in the development, there's actually no check carried out by the planning authority. Um, and, and I know that my own ward and neighbouring wards, despite what's stated on the application form, it's often not native species, but much cheaper shrubs and trees that are put in by developers. Is there an opportunity um, to include new developments in the monitoring? Um, I've, I've got another question, if I just carry on, is that okay, Chair? Yeah, carry on, carry on, Lynn. Uh, with reference specifically to the Northern Corridor um, and the repeated incidents of council staff cutting areas of wildflower that, that have been agreed um, with the Northern Corridor community volunteers, um, and despite the signage, you know, the, 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 the meadows have been cut. I know it's been raised through the appropriate channels, um, and I, you know, I, I appreciate that. But I think there's also an opportunity to have staff awareness raising courses, which might be included in the plan as well. Um, and as I'm a pedant, there's a typo on page 41. Uh, CEPA, it's environment, not environmental. Thank you. Great, Lynn, thanks very much for that. Nicole, do you want to come back and answer that, please? I do. Thank you, convener, and thank you, Councillor Anderson, for, for the question. So um, you're quite correct, there is a requirement um, by the planning authority um, to, to uh, ask developers um, in terms of the species on individual sites. Um, I will revert to my colleagues as to whether there is an opportunity um, to include within the biodiversity duty report, which we have here, um, the monitoring. But certainly, I'm happy to raise it separately with colleagues in planning that we do undertake regular monitoring um, that can be reported back to committee. The second issue there in terms of cutting of uh, wildflower meadows and biodiversity areas, um, Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with the fact that, um, unfortunately, uh, we do erroneously, um, given the millions of square metres of grass that we cut each and every cycle, um, go into areas that, that shouldn't be cut in terms of um, wildflower meadows. Wildflower meadows are something which I've worked on for a number of years and, and remain quite close to, to my heart as well. So we have undertaken um, further work to ensure that these are mapped out um, and that uh, the cutting crews who come in to undertake our grounds maintenance grass cutting every year um, are informed of where they are and the maps updated. Um, so with continued input, um, I hope that we get uh, right in these areas in terms of wildflower meadows, because as Councillor Anderson will, will be aware, um, they, they, they tend to thrive uh, at different times of year, so it's not always immediately uh, obvious where the wildflower meadow areas are. But as I say, with continued mapping um, and continued reinforcement to the crews, um, I'm pretty confident that we'll get that right uh, as we head into to 2021. Okay, thank you Councillor Anderson. 
Lynn, are you happy with that, Lynn? I am, thank you. Thank you. Um, and we'll get the typo sorted out. <laughs> um, Councillor Cullen, David Cullen. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd just like to welcome the, the report on the biodiversity duty for the period 18 to 21. Um, biodiversity is a, you know, it's a vital part of environmental um, sustainability um, across you know, the entire country. What I would like to sort of see in the future is hopefully a bit more on public education because you know, public assuming we don't cut grass in a particular area, that it's just been left to, to grow wild. They need to understand that the biodiversity is about a lot. It's about rewilding areas and you know, encouraging you know, species to come back and encouraging insects and all that to, 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 to utilise areas that they wouldn't utilise if it was just mown grass. So it's the onus is on all of us as elected members to ensure that whenever you know, whenever biodiversity projects are in place, that, that we understand it and are, we're able to articulate it to members of the public that might not understand that leaving something to grow wild is good for the environment and it's not necessarily all about cutting, cutting budget. Thanks. Thanks, Jack, David. Um, I don't see any further names in the chat bar, so colleagues, can I then direct you to the two recommendations at the bottom of page 31, and are we happy to uh, agree to uh, approve this uh, report? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item five on the agenda, which is electrical, electric vehicle charging infrastructure strategic partnership, and it's an update, and it's on page 55 to 65, uh, 57 to 65, and Nicole is just going to take a whistle stop tour of this. Thank you. A whistle stop tour indeed, convener. Um, thank you very much. So members will recall that exactly a year ago um, I brought a, an initial report which laid out the opportunity to the council in terms of project pace. Um, a partnership project, you'll recall a uh, groundbreaking partnership project, some £5.3 million worth of investment um, between North and South Lanarkshire councils, supported as part of uh, an electric vehicle strategic partnership led by Scottish Government and a range of partners to include Transport Scotland, Scottish Southern Electricity networks and Scottish Power Energy Networks. Um, I'm really pleased to bring a report today which updates members on the very significant progress um, despite COVID-19 that has been made on um, the implementation of a charging network across North Lanarkshire. Um, members will recall that we had um, aimed to, to actually set out 50 fast dual socket and 162 rapid chargers across the Lanarkshires. Um, in terms of progress, the first chargers, um, as I'm sure members will be aware, um, went into Strathclyde Park in July last year, which saw the initial provision of three rapid chargers and three fast chargers. The site was officially opened by the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity on the 5th of August. And since then, um, Spain, our delivery partners, have made considerable progress throughout 2020. This has seen completion of sites within Coat Bridge, Airdrie, Cumbernauld, Motherwell, Kilsyth, Wishaw, Moody'sburn, View Park and Shots, meaning that we now have an additional 21 rapid, 21 fast and 20, 20 slow chargers installed and available for public use throughout North Lanarkshire. It includes strategic sites such as Drumpelia Country Park, Broadwood Stadium and the Kent Town Capsule and Coat Bridge, as well as Strathclyde Country Park. Within Appendix 2, members will find a full list of sites, the number of chargers installed or proposed to be installed and the number and type of chargers at each site. Before the end of March 2021, the financial year, um, there are plans to install EV chargers at two further sites within North Lanarkshire, which are uh, within Bells Hill and Cumbernauld Village. Um, really, I'd like members just to, to um, have a look at the recommendations, um, one of which includes um, the novation to approve our legal services to novate the maintenance contract and ownership of the assets to North Lanarkshire Council following the legislative changes to North to, uh, as part of the Clean Energy Package in December 2020. Um, I'd like to highlight that this comes at no cost to the Council. So the original plan had been that the apparatus and its maintenance would rest with Scottish Power and Energy Networks. Um, Brexit and the, the, the requirements of the UK Government now means that that passes to us, but the maintenance package um, is paid for for the next five years. So it comes, as I say, at no cost to the Council. I'm happy, of course, to take any questions on the paper. Thanks for that, Nicole. Um, we've got a couple of uh, uh, contributors. Lynn, you first. Lynn Anderson. Thanks, Chair. Always delighted to be a report that doesn't cost any money. Um, 
I, I, want, I wanted to ask Nicole about, um, or, or perhaps Lizanne actually, um, it's with regard to measure of success, um, 5.3 in page 61, the Northern Corridor uh, community volunteers have been developing proposals for active travel hubs um, at Moody'sburn at the Pivot Centre um, and Steps Railway Station, uh, and there's, a, there's potential to improve the cycling infrastructure linking into the Council's wider partnership work with the Seven Locks Active Travel um, ambitions. Uh, I know there's some work underway. Matt was looking into having um, portable um, areas where we could store bikes and things like that. It, it seems to have been stuck. They've got money stuck in budgets, which they're desperate to spend. Um, and I, I think if, if unless that's speeded up, there might be no, it's a, a missed opportunity for some joined up working. Is that a possibility? Uh, Nicole, do you want to come back in and comment on that, please? Can I family first ask Lizanne to come in and comment on that? Because I, I saw her nod. OK, Lizanne, I got it wrong again. Right, Lizanne? Only, only to come in and say that I'll pick that up with Matt Costello um, and confirm the position. Um, but I don't know right now um, what, what the delay is, so I, I wouldn't be able to advise committee, but I, I'll be sure to pick it up with Matt. OK. Nicole? Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, probably one of the items that I should have said, which is, is um, indirect related to Councillor Anderson's point, is that actually through the, the same fund um, via Scottish Government in Spain, that um, Getting Better Together Shots um, have, I think, recently taken delivery of a couple of electric minibuses um, as part of the same fund, um, which is obviously a, a good news story for our wider communities as well. So it's just worth adding that, convener. Also, if I can add on to that, Glenboy uh, Development Trust of, uh, are in the process of getting two electric vehicles themselves, not minibuses, but vehicles. So it's all it's all working together. Um, Councillor Goldie, uh, Wally. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, two, just two or three things. I uh, really welcome the partnership between the the Scottish Power ourselves, South Lancashire Council and the Scottish Government, and also welcome the Scottish Government cash that's come into it. Uh, two or three questions. Broadwood is currently a COVID vaccination centre, which is absolutely fantastic. Do we advertise where the closest available site is if people can't charge their vehicles there? Um, another question is, uh, two or three uh, in the paper, there was issues with Strathclyde Water Park, I think it was, uh, and another site of that where there was accessibility issues. It's just to see what the accessibility issues were. Uh, and really, the the final point is uh, it was absolutely fantastic. The council has been generous and been supplying free, en free energy to everyone at the charging points. I wasn't particularly aware of that. And it's disappointing that the commercial vehicles have been abusing our goodwill. What are the commercial charges? Well, we're going to have to start charging for the the charging points and uh, obviously for the upkeep of the equipment or that at some point. What are the, the commercial charges of that? Uh, and are we likely to match the commercial or be less than that? Um, it's just really it's just interesting to see the rollout of this. And we don't want to be left out of pocket, but we don't want to be seen as privateering on it. Cheers. Thanks for that, Willie. Um, uh, Nicole, do you want to come in and make, uh, answer some of the points, please? Absolutely, convener. Thank you. Thank you for the questions, Councillor Goldie. Um, first of all, I'll tackle um, Broadwood Stadium. Um, so, yes, the member's absolutely correct. Um, as you know, we're in a, a very fast and fluid um, situation as regards COVID-19. Um, so, Broadwood Stadium, the apparatus is in, installed and functioning. Um, but, of course, the site's been um, taken over quite correctly um, as a COVID-19 uh, centre. So, what, what we do is we pub um, on the website. We don't necessarily advertise there at the site what's available. We do publish on the website and it's part of the Charge Place Scotland network. Um, so anyone who's looking for charging capability um, knows where the remainder of our sites are um, and it adds to the network that we have already. So the public are aware of where they are. 
Um, in terms of the very specific issue about the accessibility issues over one of the sites um, and why it wasn't taken forward, um, I'd ask if I can come back with the exact detail of that to Councillor Goldie, um, I think is best. Um, and, and it's absolutely an interesting point you're raising and quite correct, Councillor Goldie. So the, the cost that we do have, um, of course, for electric vehicle chargers at this point in time is for the electricity. Um, and it is a disappointment uh, to the wider team um, as well that commercial vehicles are using the facilities, uh, particularly at Strathclyde Park. We have undertaken discussions with those commercial vehicle op operators because whilst it's great that they're investing in electric technology, um, we of course wouldn't wish uh, to, to necessarily subsidise the businesses in that way. So we are in discussions with them about, um, and Scottish Power, etc., um, about apparatus for their own depots. Um, but I think the member raises a, a very valid point, and it's one which we will bring a paper back on um, later in the year, and that's to determine the appetite of the council. So we'll bring you the actual usage of the chargers, the costs of the usage of those chargers, which at the moment, you're quite right, is free, um, and then determine the appetite of committee um, as to whether you would wish to see um, charging instituted there uh, or indeed not. There are thoughts um, from, from government that indeed um, to install uh, a charging regime um, would actually uh, act as a catalyst um, for other investors. And in fact, by leaving them free um, means that we're not, uh, in terms of private investment, uh, we're, we're not uh, suitable at this point. But that's something which we continue to discuss, um, particularly with Transport Scotland um, and South Lancashire Council, of course, as well, who we've, we've entered this project with. But I will bring a paper back uh, to committee. In terms of the specific point about commercial charges, um, we haven't specifically looked at commercial charges, but I see it's part of that uh, potential charging paper, I will bring that back to committee later in the year. Thanks for that, Nicole. Molly, are you happy with that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, David, David Cullen. Thanks, Chair. Um, basically, my question was answered. It was just round about the, the charging mechanism. Obviously, electricity doesn't come free. Some, somebody's paying for it somewhere along the line. Um, and I think you've answered that quite fully for me, Nicole. I look forward to the paper that comes in the future. OK, colleagues. I uh, don't see anybody else's name or uh, in the chat bar. Um, so then, can I take us to the recommendations, which are three of on page fifty-seven? I'm happy to approve the, the recommendations. Agreed. Thank you, colleagues. That brings us to the end of our uh, uh, agenda. So, can I thank you all for your attendance um, and wish you a very good day? Can I ask the officers to stay on for a minute or two after the meeting, please? Thank you.